Open the meeting of the Santa Barbara Unified School Board. I'll open the meeting of the Santa Barbara School Board and we'll stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 Thank
and fix the cap refers to Senate Bill 858, which prevents school districts from maintaining adequate budget reserves for rainy days. And that's been the subject of local news and uh, na uh, state and national news as well. Um, and we'll look forward to that. And that concludes the superintendent's report. Thank you, Mr. Heron. Uh, questions of Dr. Cash. Um, on the roofing you just mentioned, um, I received a, a letter in the last week asking if our roofing is being built in such a way that maybe in the future solar could be put on them. Is that taking place? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, and the other thing that this morning at the uh, DLAC, and, and I don't know the answer to this question, but has, has every principal and vice principal um, received a copy of the DLAC report to the, to the board last meeting? I, I, yeah, I think so. I mean, I know it's available on the website, but I guess my question is, has a copy been delivered to each one? I think it's been electronically delivered. I don't think a hard copy has been. Yes. That's so every principal, every assistant principal has Well, I don't know about assistant principals, but every principal. Because right. uh, princi assistants were there today. Yeah. And I, I get the feeling from the hour that I sat that it would be beneficial if they knew exactly what DLAC has told us they want. Yes, because sir. when they go back to their sites, if they know what DLAC wants, they'd be much more apt to maybe fulfill some of those things. We'll do so. We'll make sure they get it. Thank you. Uh, you was that also your superintendent report? Yes. OK. Uh, board comments and correspondence? I know it's been a quiet month. Anybody? Monique? Well, it, it's, yeah, it's been a quiet month, but there's been a lot of community um, activities. I did see some of our students participate in this weekend's um, festivities in town, and I think we all got an invitation to a shoe mash exhibit that will be happening um, August 20th, and, and I had a chance to talk to some folks um, about that as well, um, and they really want to get educators on board for that. Uh, I was able to attend the Autism Beach Day, and again, about 40 children with, with autism uh, and their parents, and about 100 volunteers um, you know, giving these children rides on their surfboards. A, a group called the SEALs does it every year. And uh, to see the, the love the parents have for their children and the, the love the SEALs have for those children and to see them excited coming in on those surfboards for the first time in many cases, um, makes me realize totally that um, what the parents go through and how their lives are so different than mine, it's, you know, and they, the love is there, that's for sure. So hopefully anything we can do as a school district to make sure those children, all children, get the education they need, I mean, it's, to me, that's what we're here for. Uh, I attended the Adelante uh, board meeting and they uh, are going forward with two new portables, and uh, it's a quite an expensive project. And um, you know, they're, they're adding two new portables as long as they can get all the approvals of DSA and the, and the district. And the district is being tremendously cooperative on that, and I appreciate that, Dr. Cash, um, because that does make them able to let the children that are there go on into the higher grades because they need the portables for the higher grades, and, um, and they're doing a great job. Uh, they also uh, approved 99.9% .9 of the MOU and the um, facility agreement. There's still a little couple things, I guess, that are we'll talk about later on tonight. And uh, I was uh, fortunate to attend the partners retreat, partners in education, and a lot of it come back to, to our district. I mean, we are the dominant recipient of their um, intern program, the computers for families, their teacher support, the number of our teachers who take advantage of them providing um, support in the classroom is huge. And um, this whole idea of the digital divide definition changing from, from equipment to the internet, that's where the digital divide now is, is kids have a computer at home, but they can't access the internet. And that, that is now an, another huge problem on the internet divide. So it was a, a great uh, recruit, uh, a retreat, and um, they have big plans for uh, helping our district, which I think is great. Okay. Um, announcement of closed sessions.
In regards to uh, item B1, petition for readmission of expelled student, we took care of that in closed session, correct? No? We need a, oh, that comes later. That comes later. Yes. Um, item B2, approval denial of interdistrict transfer appeals for 2015-16 school year. Number of interdistrict transfer appeals were two. Motion made by Parker, seconded by um, Dr. Paz uh, to approve the appeal um, for cases 16-1 and 16-2 for two interdistrict transfer appeals was passed unanimously. Uh, we had a conference uh, with the real property negotiator for um, a lot of uh, um, issues regarding uh, issues with the city and us on properties throughout our district. Uh, just a general discussion. And in number B5, uh, we just heard the information and um, Dr. Cash will be taking care of that. Public comments, not agenda items. Dr. Paz? We have one speaker, uh, Mr. Kenneth Locke. And you'll have three minutes, Mr. Locke. My name is Kenneth Locke. What well, just went before the city did a public comment today and brought the sign that I'm flying off my bicycle. It says, got pathetic. And uh, uh, the idea of the connection between pathetic and pathological and the idea that the, uh, um, for education, I think I've been, I've been pushing for some years, I've been speaking before you, you, this uh, committee and the, uh, been pushing interdisciplinary and it actually, it's uh, really important that um, education actually reforms itself into the interdisciplinary because the problem is specialized and, and kind of education is stuck on specialized, stuck on pathetic, sorry to say, and uh, the nature of the evolution of the next generation, uh, what I'm here to uh, explain is uh, in relation to the mind-body integration, as I probably mentioned before to you guys. Um, mind-body exercise and the whole basis of what it means to be of sound mind and body. And I'm sorry to say that uh, currently education is not providing the children with the means for becoming of sound mind and sound body uh, in relation to a mind-body exercise. And actually I've been providing uh, the information in relation to how tennis represents itself as a mind-body exercise, a complete knowledge, integrated knowledge, complete and integrated exercise, ambidextrous. I'm going, I go down to the municipal courts and I, I, uh, I'm continually to develop myself holistically because I'm going to represent the standard for the next generation of tennis teachers um, so that, uh, and raise the kids up so they're, they're not pathetic. Right now, the, the teachers right now in relation to tennis as well as, I'm sorry to say, in relation to all sports uh, is, is not making the grade. And uh, once we have a uh, reference, that's what I'm going to provide through the means of tennis, uh, we can actually use it as a, like a freezing point, boiling point for understanding a foundation, again, in relation to develop, developing a sound mind and then uh, opposed to an unsound mind and an unsound body and the idea of how that is pathetic and uh, but uh, yeah I'm sorry to have to have to kind of turn the light on this but I'm hoping that eventually people kind of have the ability to turn away from uh, being pathetic and recognize the, the nature of that and um, we'll see if uh, if possibly that, uh, that, that's going to come to a fruition type of situation. But I, I'm seeing that uh, the nature of this world right now is that it's becoming more and more pathetic and something has to be done about it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Item DA, donation requests, acceptance of donations. I'll move to accept with gratitude. Second. Discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, consent calendar, any items to be removed? Ms. Limon? 
I don't actually want to remove any um, items, but I do want to make a note that there's several contracts with the city and most of those are um, ratifications, but because we got blank sheet, well, that we only saw the signatures on behalf of the district. The, um, Nancy Rapp has retired from the city and I just noticed that she was the signature on one of those. So I just wanted to note that and thank Nancy Rapp for her years of service um, to Santa Barbara, but um, there's several there that I wanted to know. And it may not matter because it's a ratification at this point, so. Uh, you just reminded me when you said ratification. Uh, I noticed, again, there's a couple items um, for us to ratify trips that already took place. And I know it's not a big deal, but it was a big deal back in 2010 or 11 in that time frame when we really want, I mean, the rules say if you want to be reimbursed, you do it and get our approval first. And I know that there's been a delay between our last meeting and this meeting, but these were items that could have been done before our last meeting. And before it gets out of hand, I'd like to just remind everybody that there are policies and procedures that we want followed. Uh, I think we, sh we should have followed. And I know you're doing your best to do that, but uh, there were a couple more ratifications. There was one last time. So just a reminder to staff uh, to do it per the bylaws. Uh, there is a change on E7, the minutes. Uh, one change uh, related to comments by me under item uh, nine of the minutes. And um, thank you for making those changes. I appreciate it. Um, anything else? Do I have a motion? I'll move to approve the consent calendar with the um, revised uh, revisions to the minutes from the July 7, 2015 meeting under item E7. I'll second that. Discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. There is no public hearing. We'll go to the action items, action agenda, G1, uh, board action on petition for readmission of an expelled student, uh, education case number 201415-07. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Don't all speak at once. <laughs> Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. If we have to want to move faster, we need to make motions <laughs> faster. Okay. Um, approval of pre intern permit for a deaf, harding of, hard, hard of hearing, um, G2. Dr. Cash. Thank you, Mr. Heron. Um, Mr. Trina. Yeah, good evening, board. Uh, the background on this petition is the Commission on Teacher Credentialing. The CTC permits districts to credential teachers using a pre-intern permit, PIP. The PIP allows an employing agency to fill an immediate staffing need by hiring an individual who has not yet met the subject matter competence requirement needed for to enter an intern program. We have had the position advertised and no one has applied for the position. The board is required to approve the agreement to employ using a pre-intern permit as an action item before the CTC acts at one of their regularly scheduled meetings. The district requests the board approve the following pre-intern permit, deaf, hard of hearing. We are confident the candidate for this position will compete, complete her credentials requirements. Uh, we also want to note that Alicia Ponce has been hired as a deaf, hard of hearing teacher. She is a graduate of San Marcos High School and benefited from our own DHOH program. She currently holds a BA degree in English from CSUN. She worked as a DHOH teacher during the 2014-15 school year on a short-term staff permit. She is currently enrolled in the DHOH program at CSUN and has one course to complete prior to being issued her intern credential in December. Discussions? Dr. Paz? Yeah, since this is, a, this is a, sort of an exceptional case in, in the sense that there's not a lot of teachers who fit this category, how much support does this teacher or um, going to have moving forward because sort of an unusual position, not necessarily that many in our district. She has uh, plenty of support. She actually has two interpreters who work with her currently. Okay. Thank you. Do I have a motion for approval? I'll make a motion to approve the pre-intern permit for the deaf, hard of hearing. Second. Discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried unanimously. 
Number G3, approval of new classified job description, Aquatic Activities Coordinator. Thank you very much, Mr. Heron. Um, if board members will recall, um, approximately a, over a year and a half ago, um, our district undertook a, a fairly exhaustive process on examining our aquatic center safety procedures, protocols, and facilities. And I've been meeting uh, consistently with uh, what we're calling our pool safety committee, which consists of representatives from all three high schools, representatives from facilities, and from the business office. And one of the items that came out of that conversation, along with uh, a number of other items that you'll be seeing later, um, was the need to have someone who could help really with the aquatics teachers. Um, unless you happen to have a grandson that's in, the, in one of our high school aquatics programs, it's hard to really understand the amount of time that's required by our aquatic staff, our teachers, in maintaining and uh, facilitating the use of those, those pools. It's, uh, as described to me in listening in the committee, sometimes it, it, it felt like they were saying they were working essentially 24 hours a day, seven days a week kind of deal with some really specifically busy times during tournaments. One of the really neat things that you should all be aware of is that there's a really neat sense of camaraderie amongst our aquatics um, coaches and about how they work together. Uh, if one coach is holding a clinic or a tournament, how the other coaches work with that coach um, in any way that they can to ensure that it runs as smoothly as possible, uh, including you know, loaning equipment, um, use of their own, their own pool facility. Um, so which was a really good thing to, and I just, that was just an observation I had in meeting with them regularly over the last 18 months. Um, so this position is before you, it's, an inc it's, an, a, it's a new, brand new position. It's a position that um, something like it does exist in other school districts. Um, the, I, I'm gonna go ahead and comment on it since I, I can see Mr. Heron is circling the range on it. Um, that there was a long conversation about what, where we wanted to place this on the classified salary schedule in order to ensure we'd get the kind of candidates who would be qualified to really fill the position. So um, I'm sorry, Mr. Torina, but I felt I could give some background on that. Is there anything you'd like to add? No, not at this time. Not at this time. Questions? I, I had one question that stuck out at me. Uh, the fifth bullet under essential functions perform light and routine custodial duties to maintain pool or locker areas in safe, clean, and hygienic condition. I mean, is that being a janitor? Well, well, yeah, our aquatics coaches currently are. Um, we're talking about picking up trash, um, wiping down equipment, that sort of thing, which is essentially we would need to put in there. Okay, but does, does that take away duties of other people who no. do those things? No, currently it's other people are doing them, which is our coaches. But does that go into the locker areas and yes, everywhere bathroom areas? Uh huh. And yep. And our coaches? Yep. Clean the bathrooms? Well, I mean, if if we don't have a custodian and they are working on a Saturday and they have a, a water polo tournament going on, yeah, you bet they pitch in. Okay. Absolutely. Same question. And this would be for each pool site? So yes, three. It's one, three high schools. Right. Mm -hmm. Ms. Parker? I have a question about one of the further down bullets where it says act as a lifeguard if properly trained and certified. Um, in what context, what times would we ask them to act as a lifeguard? When there's no other lifeguard present. So it would be like a, act as a substitute lifeguard? Well, um, there's... I, yeah, I guess that's a that's a good way to look at it. Okay, yeah. just to, I, I don't think that we need to change the language on the description yeah. just for personal clarification. Yeah, that's probably a good way to look at it. Dr. Paz. So is there um um so is the five point five hours the minimum the amount of work that they'd be working on a particular day, and up to eight hours or no, they, it, it, it'll be irregular as the assignment okay. says. So. Um, some days, they, you know, they could come in at four in the afternoon and work till midnight. Some days they come in at noon. Some some days they wouldn't work all week in order to work all day Saturday and all day Sunday. Okay. Um, 
would depend on whatever is happening. Right. It's okay. it's one of those things that will be, you know, schedules will be mutually determined by the aquatics coach, the athletic director, and the administrator in charge of athletics. Okay. Ms. Parker? So when it says reports to an assigned supervisor, would that be the AD or would that be uh, 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 an assistant principal? It'll be an assistant assistant principal, but the AD will be a person who will coordinate their their work along with the aquatics coach. Do I have a motion to approve the classified job description? I'll make the motion approval of the new classified job description for an aquatic activities coordinator. Second. Second by Dr. Paz. Discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried unanimously. Uh, G4, approval of resolution 2015-16-03, approving the tax roll for the Santa Barbara Unified School District for measure A-2012, parcel tax 2015-16. We have Mr. Tedeschi here for both the next two items. Okay, well back. Back here again, as we were last year, we just completed the process of compiling the big um, list of parcels that we sent to the County of Santa Barbara, the auditor's office, of which goes on the tax bills that charges the parcel taxes um, to the citizens of the area. Uh, part of this process is removing all of the senior exemptions from those, those lists of parcels so that they aren't billed for the parcel tax as per the parcel tax language. This first resolution in front of you is for Measure A, which consists of all of the parcels that make up what used to be the Santa Barbara High School District and for this taxing purposes it's still defined the same way that it was before the unification. In the the Measure A High School District we ended up having 48,638 taxable parcels and for Measure A we had 709 senior exemptions that we processed. How does that compare to previous years? The last year, it's, a, it's more. We had 603 last year in Measure A. Total between Measure A and B, we had 151 more senior exemptions this year than last year. So we, um, per the Auditor, Controller, and Government Code guidelines, we ask you to pass this resolution allowing them to put our parcel tax on the tax bills of the um, of the citizens of Santa Barbara County that live in our high school district. So I'll take any questions. Uh, Well, I guess I have one question. Last year we had a problem in this process. Has that been corrected for this year? Yes, that was a data issue where certain seniors got charged that shouldn't have been charged. And as soon as we found out, we sent out a bunch of refund checks and apology letters. And I double checked to make sure that wouldn't happen this year. Thank you. But thanks for reminding me. Uh, Discussions and motion? Dr. Paz moves to approve resolution 2015-16-03. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carried unanimously. Uh, G5, can you give us the numbers on that? Sure. Um, For our Santa Barbara Elementary School District parcels, we had 22,803 taxable parcels. And by taxable parcels, I mean parcels that have an an assessed value that are not government owned or church owned and they have to have a taxable value. So um, from those 22,803, prior to that we took out 408 senior exemptions. And the year before, we had 363 in the elementary district for an increase. So the total number of senior exemptions was 1,117. Um, may I ask, uh, are, I assume that most of those are duplicates for people who have done one in one district do it? Yes, yeah, Um, almost, well basically all of them. We kind of remind people when they come in with just the measure B Mm -hmm. that, you know, they're also eligible for measure A, you know, Mm -hmm. or they come and ask for the forms. But yeah, pretty much everybody who lives in this, in the uh, elementary school district also qualifies for the high school district parcel tax. Do I motion to approve resolution 2015 slash 16 dash 04? I'll make the motion to approve the resolution 2015 or slash 16 dash 04. Second. Uh, Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried unanimously. All right, Uh, thank you. Let's go to the conference agenda H1 Family Community School Partnership, a framework for family engagement. I'd like to ask Dr. Raul Ramirez to come forward and present this item. (coughs) 
Hi, good evening, board. Uh, board President, Mr. Heron. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, I'm actually presenting, uh, so that's, as, as you all well know, uh, I've transitioned out of my previous role as director of uh, EL and parent engagement programs, but in, in that process, uh, we engaged in, in the work of um, trying to begin to develop a framework for how we would uh, begin to move forward as a district in a more coherent way um, in terms of engaging our, our parents and our uh, uh, and families in uh, supporting us in uh, student learning. And um, Dr. Mora, uh, who, is, who is now in, in that position, uh, she uh, was not able to attend today. Uh, she will be carrying this, this important uh, work forward. She has been part of this, uh, this work already. Uh, but she is up in Sacramento with uh, federal program review, which I'll, I'll be joining in tomorrow. <laughs> so, um, with that said, um, even before beginning, uh, you've had the opportunity to, to review uh, these documents, uh, but uh, I wanted to just make a, a couple of points. Uh, first is that um, this is, is only a beginning for us uh, as a district. Uh, as I mentioned uh, just previously, it's an, it's an initial attempt to uh, engage in, in, in this discussion, which, which uh, now is, 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 is taking on even a, a more uh, important and, and more prominent uh, place in, in our district. And uh, what you see and what, what we'll be discussing today is not uh, at all a, a, a finished draft or, or final draft, um, merely a beginning and, and a framework for how to begin to engage in that process. Um, we are looking to build this out, not only over this coming year, but uh, moving forward and establishing a really um, uh, a, a, a living document of sorts that will allow us to uh, continue to um, uh, evaluate, reevaluate how we uh, partner with our, with, our, uh, with our parents and families. So with that said, I uh, just wanted to get, provide you a little bit of context on, on what went into this, uh, this document and, and this initial draft. Um, as you know, we, we have um, uh, a uh, state adopted standards that have, that have uh, uh, really sent a, a ripple across our system in terms of how we deal with and how we begin to uh, address as a system and, and, and in terms of our partnerships with our, with our community and families on, um, on the rigor and the, the expectations for, for our state standards. So with that in mind, we, we also wanted to keep that as part of the context for how we how we establish those partnerships and how we establish those um, uh, those those systems, um, the the state put out a framework a few years back. I believe it's 2011 or 2012. An initial draft of a framework, a parent engagement framework, which has since been revised, which we used really as the underpinning for this uh, for this framework. Uh, very productive, very progressive, very uh, robust. Uh, it has uh, a, no a number of uh, rubrics that we're still trying to figure out how they can be uh, put forward in a more user-friendly way. But it's, but it's very, uh, it's very explicit and it's very much aligned to the work that we're doing here. Um, on a local context, we we know that this is a, a big priority as part of our LCAP is parent involvement and engagement, and we're not using those. Uh, those terms uh, interchangeably, they are different, and we will try to define those more, more clearly as we move forward. Uh, but we know that we need both. We need our parents involved in our schools and in our school district um, if there is going to be engagement. So we see those as, as, as maybe points in a continuum as opposed to uh, defined uh, unto themselves. Um, and also uh, locally, uh, a lot of work has been put into uh, the community of schools over the last few years. Uh, formerly the uh, Westside Project and uh, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Uh, Guillermo Juan and uh, Dr. Madrigal have played critical roles in, in, in having uh, an understanding both from the uh, practical uh, work that has already been done and the history of, of parent involvement and engagement in our district, as well as um, uh, an eye forward on how to evaluate uh, our effectiveness and how to evaluate the work that we do. Um, and, and, and really, ultimately, we know that it comes down to the site level because that is the biggest and, and most frequent and most important point of contact for our parents, for our families. Uh, it's um, how does that uh, partnership between us as a school or a school district uh, impact and, and, and begin to in, um, to have, a, have an impact on student achievement. 
um, with uh, all the while trying to establish authentic parent engagement opportunities. Uh, we, we understand that that is a, a critical aspiration for us uh, to, to turn every encounter uh, that we have uh, at every level into something that, that uh, that is authentic, well-intentioned, and, and in keeping with the, the, uh, the capital that our parents and families bring to us every day. So uh, here are just the components of, a few components of the framework. Uh, we have kind of overarching program dimensions, as you can see in the document. And we have specific action areas where most of, most of the, uh, the uh, practices have been uh, captured. Um, and, and we have some guiding district principles. Now these district principles are, are largely uh, adapted and taken from the uh, CDE framework, but I think they, they fit very well and, and align very well with uh, what, what's been uh, established through our strategic plan and, and through our LCAP. So we feel very, very confident that, that, that there is a significant alignment between what the, what the, uh, what the state has put out and what we, uh, I think, um, the values that we hold as, as a district. Uh, from there, we, we also wanted, and, and we understand that there isn't a, a uh, nor, nor will there be a, a causality between uh, parent involvement and engagement and student outcomes. Uh, we we want to be very clear about that. But we do want to inform our, uh, and, and be very intentional about the, the practices that we engage in as a means of supporting and, and, and really um, in uh, impacting uh, in as much as we can uh, student outcomes uh, and you'll see at every grade span I think it's important to to be very clear that uh, the the needs uh, of a child are different uh, at every point as well as for parents and now we're hoping that as we move forward we will see that uh, as parents transition from one age span to the next the work the, the connectedness the the experiences the positive experiences that they uh, have at a particular grade span can help inform the next that is that is really our long-term view um, but as we as we roll this out we want it to be very clear that um, that we're that we're, they were being very mindful of the fact that there are significant differences and therefore it, it the response and the the uh, the approach has to be differentiated um, and and finally we wanted to begin to also talk about what are parent goals what are parent goals that we can reasonably expect um, and and this is again our first attempt these will be very much uh, informed and, and and driven by uh, the work that we that we uh, engage in over the next uh, year to, to start to bring together something that's more robust and more and more um, defined. So I just wanted to take a moment and um, kind of uh, move out of this and just uh, discuss the framework itself for a little bit. Um, it, this, in, this, in, this first, um, in this first page, what, what we tried to, to do is capture uh, some of the, the major um, elements of the, the state's uh, framework. And, and again, there are the district principles as, as well as those uh, action areas that we, that we later defined. So um, as we have, have really had conversations around um, around our LCAP and what we want uh, and, and, and really our, our strategic plan, our district, uh, district strategic plan, one of the things that we, that we wanted to do was begin to, to, to identify uh, what, what we hope uh, will inform all of our practices, which is uh, the goal of, of establishing life, career, and college-ready students. Uh, so these are, these are outcomes that, that we've, we've really uh, begun to, to uh, formulate as a way of, of really um, ensuring that, that, that our work is really aligned and, and always informed by what we would want to see as, as, as outcomes uh, once students are, are ready to, to leave our district and, and enter into, into either higher ed or the workplace. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that that, that, that was, that was uh, 
always at the forefront. Um, it, what you see uh, beneath that is then uh, the grade spans. And we wanted to incorporate uh, early childhood into this. We, we understand that uh, we're play, placing a great deal of emphasis into our early childhood programs and partnerships. Now um, we have our kindergarten readiness network, which is, which is uh, really uh, is emerging as a, as a really productive way to engage our uh, partners and the community uh, around uh, early childhood and, and preschool programs. But uh, we know that we only have a, a certain measure of, uh, of influence over our preschool. So we wanted to, to, to ensure that, that we were really looking at our system first. And, um, and, and so you see um, in more maybe exact or, or precise uh, goals some of the, some of the beginnings of, of what we want to see. And this was largely taken from the community of schools project, which is, which is still ongoing. And um, if you look at early childhood, uh, one of our one of our real outcomes of that grade sp of that age span is to achieve kindergarten readiness, and we have some metrics that can inform there, uh, and we're hoping as part of our assessment continuum to build build that out in a more robust way. Uh, in our elementary, uh, we we've all heard and seen the research around uh, literacy and uh, the the importance of establishing strong um, literacy skills, particularly by grade three. That that that's a very pivotal year. It just happens to coincide with with uh, uh, the new uh, beginning points for standardized testing. But really, this is more about what the research tells us about, uh, about literacy and how it informs a future for, for a student. Uh, in, in, at the junior high level, uh, again, in keeping, we want to make sure that we're, uh, and, and some of this language will shift, but really meeting or exceeding state adopted standards. And I know that there's going to be new measures for, for how that can, can be and how that, how that should take place. But um, that's, that's a, a starting point. By the, by the high school, uh, we have a number of other um, uh, outcomes that we would, we would like to see really for, for all our students. And, and a lot of them are, are really geared toward uh, ensuring that they have viable opportunities and viable uh, plans uh, moving forward once they leave the district. So, so again, that is the context. That's what we want to align to. And we want to ensure that all the work that we do really is, is pointed in that direction. Uh, once you start filtering down, we start to look at uh, some parent goals. And those are differentiated. There are some commonalities and some themes. But there's really uh, an attempt, at least an initial attempt, to differentiate them by, by grade span. Uh, you'll see college and career readiness starting as early as um, elementary, because we understand that there, uh, we can't wait until the secondary to 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 start to establish not only that conversation with students, but really that preparedness, and um, and and another big big piece of that is uh, shared leadership. Uh, this notion that that uh, this understanding that parents play a vital role in informing our work, in establishing the kind of environment um, at school sites and as a district where where there's going to be success uh, and when they're going to feel really empowered to, to be able to, uh, uh, to, to have a stake in, in what's going on in, in, in classrooms and at the school. Um, and, and that really uh, begins to kind of focus on or, or blend its way through with some differentiation across each, each, um, each grade span. One important component that I wanted to just uh, point out is that um, accessing and navigating community and educational systems. Uh, and what you'll see here is also an attempt to, to really address. And, and this, this process really informed by our work around cultural proficiency. Um, different uh, families and, and parents have different needs. And uh, this is a, an acknowledgment of just that. Um, our, our parents come to us with a differing um, understanding of what the school system is attempting to uh, achieve. And, and the more that we can keep that at the forefront, the better off will be in terms of avoiding a, just a generic approach to, 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 uh, to how we engage our parents. Um, it, once you build down, you have a building capacity. And, and there, specifically, we, we, we listed out, um, this was also an attempt for us to, in, in many ways, inventory the kind of partnerships that we have that have been very successful over time and that have, have, have yielded a lot of uh, 
uh, or at least anecdotally, if not even with use of some some survey data, would uh, would give us an impression that um, that they're helping in, in in empowering parents with knowledge of how to navigate the system, of how to access resources within our district and even externally in the community. So uh, there are a number of different uh, partnerships that um, school sites or even us as a district have engaged in, and we we um, see the value in maintaining those and fostering those um, as as we learn more about what our system can do, is equipped to do, and can, um, uh, and how we develop our own internal capacity to either meet those needs or just better uh, uh, provide more robust and, and productive partnerships. Um, the professional learning, that's, that's left more or less open-ended at this point because we're, we're going to be letting data and, and, and kind of this process inform the kind of work that we need to do. We have a sense of it in terms of how we should be um, developing as professionals and leaders uh, at all levels. But um, we, 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 we're still, I think we, we have a lot to, to learn yet about what that process really looks like in a more formative way and in a more formal way. Um, demonstrating leadership, we have a number of committees. You, you uh, earlier in the in the meeting, we, we mentioned the the DLAC um, and and the the site level ELACs, uh, just as an example. But we have um, we have a number of district committees that have been instrumental to providing us uh, important and valuable feedback that are very much uh, driven by parent leaders, uh, uh, leaders of parent leaders that are that are leaders in the community, leaders at school sites, and, and at all levels, uh, and at every age span group. So we, we recognize that those that those committees need to be uh, developed further uh, with a more intentional approach. Um, and, and, and we just there also um, addressed a few kind of examples of how that uh, how that can play out. But we do understand also that, that our structures, whether it's LCAP or single plans, really need to be uh, where all of these plans are fully and, and more robustly articulated. Uh, and again, coming back to that intentionality and that approach to really put resources, goals, plans, and programs uh, in, in a way that, uh, that really puts it out there for our school community and our district community. Um, again, with the fiscal resources, it goes back to that point as well. Uh, we know that um, our resources need to be steered in that direction, but that um, it's not just a matter of, of, of aligning resources, it's what we do and what kind of goals we want. So this was our, our initial attempt to start to really provide a, 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 a guide, uh, a way of, of providing uh, some information for our sites to make more informed and purposeful decisions around uh, those use of those funds. And then um, we have a number of different, uh, both parent and student indicators. Some of these are, are already very much within our system, and others are, are ones that are that are going to be built out, uh, including um, uh, the the evaluation of our own efforts through pre and post surveys that are that are more uh, coherent across our district, uh, rather than than just that that happenstance or, or, or randomized approach uh, wherever a site may be interested in in, um, in, in seeing what those, what those programs or approaches are yielding. Um, and then finally, one, one, one last component of this um, is, is the um, access and equity. And this, this, this really informs two plans. Um, it's informed by our cultural proficiency work again, and and uh, in the future we'll be discussing that more, more um, in a more informed way. But um, previously we've we've talked about language access. You know, I presented to you around language access and all that we're doing to um, remove language barriers uh, for for our parents. And I feel very proud of the work that we've done, uh, but we also recognize that there's more work yet to be done. And, um, and, and so this, this process is really about uh, Im implementing those, those guidelines and, and having them work in tandem so that they're, these aren't disparate plans that are operating in isolation. Um, so, so again, in terms of a, of a, of a plan of action here, 
um, or in terms of the framework, again, just to review, it is, it is a, an attempt to, to look at outcomes differentiated by grade span and also um, not just for students but for parents um, and, and, and really built around these five major action areas, uh, building capacity, um, demonstrating leadership, fiscal resources, monitoring progress, and measuring impact as well as the access and equity uh, component. And then uh, in terms of a plan of action, um, this is just uh, our initial kind of thoughts on this. Um, first and foremost, uh, our, our purpose here is to, to elicit and, 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 and have your feedback uh, as a part of this. Again, it, this is an, an initial draft, uh, very, uh, I think, solid in terms of how we can you know, better engage our, our, our parents and families in this process. Um, so your, your feedback is, is, more, than, is more, than, more than welcome. In fact, uh, we, we'd appreciate having feedback on this. Um, but uh, it really is um, a way to begin to inform those practices, particularly as we engage in the process of single plans. It's a way to put things really at the forefront as we look at how we create goals, how we uh, assess programs, and how we um, align our, our resources to meet those goals. Uh, so we've already had an opportunity to present it uh, in June to our Cultural Proficiency Committee. Um, that was a, just a very initial look at this. Uh, we have a parent engagement subcommittee within that that, uh, that is, is, is hopefully going to provide us ongoing information and feedback. Um, and, and, and it's just that at charge, we had a chance to present this also to, to principals to begin to, or, or not just principals, but our leadership. Um, to, to start to get that conversation going in terms of what, what is this missing, what can be informed, and that's going to be able, uh, this will continue to cycle through our PLTs, uh, elementary and uh, secondary commi um, uh, com uh, committees, and, and I'm sorry, uh, learning communities at, at, the, at the leadership level. Um, we also want to uh, build out of this uh, a family engagement committee. Um, and that's the, the purpose there is to, is to make sure that we have a, 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 a broad representation of, of parents that can, that can really give us uh, differing viewpoints and, and, and ideas on how to, how to build this out and move forward in, in a way that, that is in keeping with, with our district, district um, uh, goals and our, and, our, and our really core beliefs. And uh, finally, it's, it's also the development of an evaluation tool. We know that we're going to have to uh, develop the, the means by which to um, evaluate whether the programs and, and the, the activities and the partnerships that we're engaging in are, are, are really productive for our parents and are really giving us the, the kind of, uh, of uh, impact that we'd like to see in order to ultimately further student achievement. So uh, with that, um, I, I, I'd, I'd like to open it up to any questions or comments you may have. Thank you very much. Board? Ms. Limon? Thank you, Dr. Ramirez. That was very helpful. Um, a couple things, uh, comments and questions. Uh, professional learning, I was really glad to see that professional learning included administration, management, certificated, and classified, just because I thought that um, to really change a culture and to understand what everyone's role could be in any level of engagement, that was a good thing. So I was glad to see that. Um, and engagement. So engagement is hard to measure, um, particularly if you're not measuring brain waves and all that stuff, right? Um, but we know it when we see it. And there's something to be said about knowing when we get emails, knowing when there's a, uh, a room packed with families, with students, or with parents providing, uh, providing input. And we know that they're engaged. How, I mean, how do you think about measuring engagement? Like, I mean, is this committee going to then define what engagement looks like and feels like? Or are there already some pre-established definitions for the engagement you're looking for? Uh, no, there, there aren't. I know it, much, much to, to what you just defined. Uh, I think that's, that's, where we, the, that's where we are as well. I think we know it when we see it, but we want to find a way to, um, to be able to have metrics or some way of, of creating that. And, and, m and most of what you see here is largely uh, quantitative. So maybe there is a, a, an opportunity here for the qualitative approach when we talk about engagement, mm -hmm. uh, because it is more than um, having participation or involvement, which is people being present. Uh, but we can't get to engagement if we don't have that maybe as an initial step or an initial 
part of the continuum. We know we need both. We, we know we need to create opportunities for parents to be a part of our, of our community. And, and we've had a lot of internal conversations around that, but we haven't established anything definitive. So that's, that's really an opportunity for uh, both our cultural proficiency uh, work uh, which is developing and aligning rubrics to help us uh, maybe inform that process as well as our committee because uh, th there is, um, uh, you know, the parent voice uh, has, has yet to really come through and, and um, we, we want that and, and maybe that's a, another way in which we can help understand, better understand what engagement really authentically looks like. Uh, what we do know is that um, our parents, like us, also know it when they see it. And, and going back to that point about authentic uh, opportunities for parents to engage, they, 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 they know when, when they're being valued, when they're being respected, um, but how to capture that in, in, in some kind of data is, is probably going to be our challenge. But um, that's, that's something that, that we know we have to get to. Well, and I appreciate you saying that because I do think some of this is um, quantitative, but I, you know, I think of the site, uh, the school site plans and how sometimes I feel like they're check, checking off boxes um, and I don't want this to be a check off the box. I want to be able to see that things have been done, but also feel it, feel it in our boardroom, feel it in the community that we have engaged parents. I think that that's part of it. So I appreciate, and I don't think it's an easy answer by any means, but I appreciate that. Can you remind me, um, not the names of the people but the bodies of, or entities that are on the cultural uh, proficiency committee, is that made up of? Uh, that's a pretty uh, far-ranging yeah. group. Uh, you, you mean the composition of yeah. the, the actual members? Uh, community members, um, uh, administrators, counselors uh, from across the different, uh, Ms. Parker is, is a part of it as well. So we really tried to reach out and cast a wide net when it came to bringing uh, individuals in to provide really a, a, a really diverse perspective or set of perspectives. And, um, and, and so that's, again, a starting point in informing um, our initial work. Great. And will the Family Engagement Committee follow that model? Will it be? That's what we're hoping. So, okay. We're hoping. Uh, you know, we, we, we wanted to have this process stall a little bit to, to make sure that it was being informed in, in earnest through the, uh, through the Cultural Proficiency Committee because we, we understand uh, that this is, that this, it, it can't be a checkoff item. It has to be about authenticity and there's no way that, that we can accomplish that if we don't acknowledge that uh, the cultural lens is, is one that's very needed when we talk about how we, uh, how we engage with our parents and families. It's part of the reason that we didn't want to have any, at this point, initial thoughts on what the professional learning looked like because we, we, we still, that's something that, that is still building. I think it's still important and we haven't necessarily, we really need to engage with our families before having an opportunity to, to have some solid recommendations on how that should play out. Great, thank you. And then, just as a side note, I'm looking in this in this direction. We should probably put the Cultural Proficiency Committee, and if there's going to be a board member on the Family Engagement Committee, on the December list, because I think it's important to document how much um, involvement and committees there are. I know sometimes there's a lot that we're doing, but I'd like to have that in minutes and board meetings and show our community there's all these committees and here's how we're involved. So thank you. Dr. Paz. Uh, to my fellow board member, Ms. Limon's comment about how to measure, you know, I, I would suggest one of the things too that 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 needs to be also uh, part of this plan and maybe um, teased out more is also the the level of communication, because I think embedded within all of this is how we are communicating to our community. Obviously, th this is in particular focused on families, but that that is the cornerstone of all the work that we do within this district and oftentimes we run into stumbling blocks because we're not doing an effective job of communicating. So with that said, one way that you can start to kind of conceptualize how we are engaging our, our families is to kind of look at it this way. And I'm only doing this to, to, to put it out there in terms of an evaluator looking at this. Looking at the first level is awareness. 
our families aware of the different programs we have in our school district or different policies or whatever that may be. And the second level is just knowledge gain. They may be aware, but they don't have the knowledge that needs to take place. And third level, third level is behavior. Did they change because of the awareness, the knowledge that they gained? And the last is change in circumstance. And that could be, you know, okay, I was aware. I became knowledgeable. I'm starting to change my behavior. And now I actually want to participate in a committee. I want to participate in a group. I actually want to show up to my, my child's, uh, you know, uh, back to school night, whatever that may be. So now they've actually taken everything, put it into practice. So that's one way you kind of can begin to, to conceptualize that engagement, how it looks like, and I am more than happy to talk to uh, you and, and uh, Dr. Dradia in terms of maybe looking at more of that and happy to participate in some other informal conversation, but I th thought I'd throw that out there. Sure, thank you. And, um, and, and uh, to, to add another complexity to this, uh, we also um, have to uh, come up with a technological solution for how and how we warehouse yeah. all this information, mm -hmm. uh, because um, we are we are we would be essentially tracking adults, yeah. and and that's not something that our system is well equipped at this point to to be able to do. Our SIS really is about students, and tracking students, monitoring students, and being able to to to, to deal with uh, or. or uh, find a, a, a data solution for that, mm -hmm. and that's becoming a, a challenge um, with with just uh, uh, as ma many metrics as we need to establish. But now we'd be looking at adults, and that's that's a different uh, expectation altogether. And I'd be happy to. Sorry, turn off my mic. Be happy to talk to you about that as well. I'm sure Mr. Rickman would also be uh, um, a happy participant as well. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Ms. Parker. I just wanted to say thank you because it's um, you know obviously a tremendous amount of work has been done on it and I'm grateful for the state of California to have had such a robust uh, framework available for us to tweak. Um, you know it still feels uh, very theoretical at this mm -hmm. point and um, but I appreciate that everything is being pulled together in um, in sort of a coherent fashion um, as we move forward because it's uh, you know everybody I think a lot of individual principals have have essentially come up with some things like this framework for their own sites mm -hmm. um, in the past and where everything falls apart is when you try to put them into action you know what actually works you know on a, on a day-to-day -day basis what works in terms of getting parents engaged um, and we're not quite to that level yet um, right. so I'll be really curious to follow this and hopeful um, but thank you I think this is a great start thank you and and it was a, a really a collaborative and at this point a lot of eyes have been on it and um, and we're hoping that that it just continues to to morph into something and develop into something that is going to be very productive and meaningful and useful not just for our site administrators and for our staff but really for us as a community to see are, are we are we really uh, following through with the commitments that we've made uh, through our LCAP uh, and I feel very confident that that, that this is going to develop into a very very useful tool Great. we're already getting some some good feedback on it but thank you what are the plans for site plans when does, when does that process probably already started but when when do family engagement get involved in that? When do site councils get involved in that? Well, we're still determining our, our, our timeline. I think we're, we're, our, our initial conversation is that we're going to be looking at a timeline similar to the one that we had last year. But really the work of, of, of establishing uh, plans and goals and outcomes starts, I mean, it already started. It started in the spring. Um, I have a, a few sites just to, 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 to make this point that, um, that kind of changed the, the script knowing that and, and held their, their ELAC elections in the spring. Uh, knowing that they would have the summer to plan, to collaborate, to set goals, and to, to begin to inform. Uh, so I think, I think that that process has already really begun for many of our sites. Uh, so, but we, we, we hope to have something more formal for you uh, here in the, in the near future. Well, I can tell you that, speaking for me personally, when we see those site plans this year, uh, all this activity, I hope, is showing in them. Because historically in the past, I haven't seen that. So I hope there's a big change this year. Uh, that's a tall order, but we will we'll definitely, uh, it, we've already had a lot of internal conversations around that uh, with our principals, and, and, and they, they, they are very cognizant of the fact that uh, language access and, and, and 
all of these these initiatives that that, that really are aimed at, at more authentically engaging parents and family are, are really meaningful so I think you're going to be very pleasantly uh, surprised by, by what's included in the plans yeah. you know as I said this morning family engagement I think means better students and so this yeah, we, whole, we believe so too this whole process um, will ultimately be better students and that's what we're here for and better parents yes I mean I I've seen it in action and I've seen what these parents do uh, the community academy for sure I mean I've been there when the parents have been discussing these things and taking an active role I, and I understand there now the PTA and the ELAC are working together that has never been the case before they, they used to be separate entities now they're working together You'll see that 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 is is a pattern that that is is repeating itself. We we had yeah. a conversation around this just earlier today. You you were present for 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 at least a good portion of it, and I think that is more becoming the the, the expectation and hopefully the norm yeah. for how our our parent groups all work uh, together on this. And I, I see Adelante sitting here, and at their meeting a week ago, uh, two of the staff members went to IEE, and they came back, and they're going to transform that school with what they learned at IEE. I would, I've never seen two people, who two staff members, so totally engaged in creating an atmosphere within their, within their school to implement the IEE concepts and language and just what you're talking about. Yeah, and, and that's why the work of the, of the cultural proficient, the cultural proficiency work which, of which IEE is a part of and our work with uh, Just Communities, uh, it becomes so critical in, in terms of ensuring that uh, as we move forward, we always have that, that lens. Uh, from which to see um, the landscape and understand that there are different needs for different parents. It's exciting. There's a lot happening. And it's really all good. Yes. Anything else? Thank you very much. We Thank appreciate you. it. We're looking forward to the next report. Thank you. From Dr. Mora. Yes. <laughs> I think Dr. Ramirez is looking forward to Dr. Moore doing the next <laughs> report as well, since he has a whole other job. Yeah. I'd like to say the last year has been fantastic. So we appreciate what you've done the last year, and we look forward to great things in your, your new role with the elementary school teachers. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Cash, H2. Yes, um, as board members are aware, uh, annually we receive a sun shining from both of our bargaining units, and this is the sun shining for negotiating for the 15-16 year from our classified employees union. Is okay. You can scroll down to show the whole thing. Well, there should be another page attached to it. There it is. So there Wa it is. Wages, health, evaluations. Oh no, that's the district. Right. They sunshine, it's on mine. I'm sorry, that's not, show, Brian can't show it. Article 9 wages, Article 40, health and welfare benefits. Yeah, that's up there now. Okay. Any comments? Okay. And how about uh, H? Three. That's our sun, sun shining back to the Classified Employees Union. Article 9, Article 40 from CSEA, and we are proposing to look at evaluations and vacation leave. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. You're welcome. You'll soon see uh, the teachers. We will now go to H4. We have an audience for this one. Um, yes. Um, well, you have before you for any comments or direction both the, a memorandum of understanding and the facilities use agreement with Adelante Charter School. A lot of work's been done between uh, Adelante Charter School and the Santa Barbara Unified School District in getting to this particular point. We still have a couple of small items to uh, figure out, um, but basically um, what we're looking for now is any comments or questions about the document as it exists or any direction to staff. There was only one outstanding issue that I was aware of, 
and I'm not sure if the change that Adelati has suggested uh, meets the um, criteria of the, the school district, and that's on page two of 14 on the uh, facilities use agreement. On item number four, Parada share charge. Can you talk about that one, Dr. Cash? Or? Um, well, the pro rata share is calculated as the ratio of space allocated by the district to the charter school devoted by, divided by the total space owned by the district. I haven't seen any any language other than what's before you. Well, the, the, the conflict there is that the, the current language indicates that the charge for out of district students will be double the charge of in district students. Atlante has suggested that that take place if we become basic aid, because then we have out of district students taking advantage of our property without getting any compensation. And so the thought was originally that w when we were basic aid, that there was a reason for charging double. Atlante has suggested that the language be added. Um, so that's not agreeable to district staff. And I'd like to know why. And, and I'd like to know Atlante to. I'd like to hear them first. Yeah, okay. Thank goodness for technology right here. Um, good evening, it's a pleasure to see you again. Happy summer, muy buenas tardes. Um, so in our discussion and preparing the MOU and the FUA when this um, issue came up, um, so at the time when the district was a basic aid district and, and the charter school had students that were out of district, it was an expense to the district. But that's no longer the situation as the district is not in basic aid. The other thing is for a charter school, um, we have a responsibility to accept kids whether they're in the district or not in the district. That's written in ed code. So um, when we have kids, as a charter school, we have the, the, the charge of accepting kids that attend um, outside um, of the district. So, um, so it is um, just something that came to our attention and that we were hoping the district would take an opportunity to think about it and have a discussion about changing the language that if the district returns to basic aid when kids outside of the district would be um, a cost to the district that then we would have the double charge for the kids. Um, I want you to know that um, the process to prepare the MOU and the FUA has been um, exciting, interesting. It's been a, a pleasure to work with Meg and staff. Um, I wish that she were here so that I could publicly thank her, but it's gone really, really well. I've learned a lot going through the process, and um, so we are certainly grateful um, for that. So um, I think that's really all. That, that's really all. What's the economic cost of that doubling to the school? Um, I think for this year, when we looked at it, it's about $10,000. Well, that's the double cost. That's the double cost. So it would be $5,000. Um, also within the process, um, we did a, a revamp of the, uh, the costs. Um, that other length it would pay to the district for services. So I think those costs went up about 15,000 this next year. So Meg was really detailed about going through what services is the district offering to the school and let's make sure that um, the district is compensated for those services. And so we've seen a change in services and it's really a lot better. So thank you for that. Any other questions? Well, it's a lot better, but it's a lot costlier, too. Maybe, yes, it is. Maybe Nancy can <laughs> describe that cost process and what went through to get there. The With Meg. With Meg. Yeah. Um, I think that's Exhibit A, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nancy. Okay. Yep, there Okay, so last year the Exhibit A didn't look anything like this. We just took, I think, 1.5% of our revenues 
and just and and the district build us for it. And here we've just broken it down. And I mean, like I said, like Juanita said, the district staff did an amazing job of really just pinpointing how much time they spend on Autolante. And we went back and forth with a few items, but this is the agreed upon um, cost. And it did, it went up substantially, which told us that we were not paying for all the services that we had been getting, which um, now is being corrected. If you can go to the bottom of the page, I think it's like 41,000, yeah. So, <coughs> um, off the top of my head, I don't remember what the difference was, but I know that we're paying about $15,000 more in services. So. Mr. Heron? Ms. Parker? Uh, may I ask Ms. Dow, um, the, uh, going back to the interdistrict transfers and the pro rata share there, um, how many students, do you know that number off the top of the head? How many, uh, what percentage of students are from out of district? Or 12 students out of 200 and some odd? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I was at the meeting when Nancy presented this increase to the Atlante board. And the first impression was, that's a huge increase. And to Nancy's credit, she stood in front of the board and said, it's fair. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't pay our share in the past. And in her opinion, this was a six month process to get to these numbers. And uh, Nancy stood there and said, it's a, it's a fair solution. Um, Mr. Heron, if I may. Yes, Ms. Parker. I, I'm curious to hear the, um, what the district has to say about why we sh they don't want to accept the, the language in, in terms of making it so that it's the same for in, inter-district or intra-district into um, Adelante. But larger picture, one of the things that I'm thinking about in the long run is that as this board is thinking about facilities needs in the future, um, everything that we can do to show our um, in boundary taxpayers and voters that we do treat students from outside the district a little bit differently. Um, so that when we are, for example, thinking about building facilities in the future, um, that we're concentrating and we're doing it for students that are within the district and that we're not asking them to subsidize students that are from outside the district. Um, that's kind of what I'm thinking about long term. I'd love to be able to point to language in our MOU that said, look, so we, we've always treated, you know, the, the, the residential voters and taxpayers, we've treated those students a, a little bit differently than students from outside the district. Um, and, and when we're thinking about facilities needs, you know, for our own schools, like we wouldn't, for example, build out larger schools than we would need it. It would only be for our in-district schools. And I'm thinking about that for the charters as well. Um, so that's just kind of running through my head, um, but Dr. Cash, I'm curious to hear what what the district's thoughts are. Well, that that this whole conversation is fine in the context of reauthorization of the charter. This is wrapped into a lot of issues in relationship to procedure and accepting students, processing interdistrict transfer students. Um, that should be addressed in a charter reauthorization, um, not in an MOU. So if they want to increase their enrollment through interdistrict transfers because it's at no cost to the district, I think there's a good argument that that's not an accurate assessment and that's something that I would be more than happy to have a conversation about when we look at re the reauthorization of the charter and how the charter school manages its en entire enrollment processes in, in district and inter-district. Mr. Ramon? I have a question. Um, with the, our other two charter schools, are we moving to a process that will look like this? Yes. Okay, so then the plan is to be consistent with Absolutely. our two other charter schools with the um, fee recovery or reimbursement um, as well as the concept of um, intra inter district. Correct. One of the unintended consequences of no differentiation between in-district and inter-district is that when a school is full, the district is required to transport and move the student to an available district school. 
So, and currently with another charter, we're experiencing a significant financial cost as a result of that unintended consequence. Other questions or comments? I'm very confident we will be able to figure it out. Mr. Lang? Hi. Uh, just want to add a quick clarification. Actually, I'm, I'm supposed to meet with you, Dr. Cash, on Thursday. Yeah. Um, so we can also talk about further, on, further uh, related to this issue. But for starters, um, uh, we don't treat uh, uh, interdistrict uh, students the same. We have to uh, allow them to enter the charter. But if there's a lottery, we do have a differential treatment of them at that point. And so we should, you should be aware of that, that it's not every, uh, every student is not treated the, the, the exact same in terms of getting into the school, in, getting into our school. Um, and then we should be remembered too that that with about 12 um, interdistrict transfers, I think it was, um, the remaining 230 some come from the district. A large portion of them, we're supporting the local Franklin area as you know additional support there. So um, I think there's lots of things to think about in terms of. You know, you mentioned that if, if, a, if a school is full, you have to um, bus them to another school. We're actually providing a great need for the Franklin District right there with our school. Um, it, so I think that's another thing to consider um, when you're thinking about that. But I'm, I'm looking forward to talking to you on Thursday and just making sure we can finalize these issues if yeah, there are any others. I'm, I'm confident we'll be able to. Nancy, what was the current proposal for the two portables, how much does that be, is that costing Adelante? Um, we, our latest bid is $230,000. And that's coming from Adelante? Right. Hmm? And that will be No, that's for two portables, not each. Increased facilities, we'll be paying the rent on, pro rata share of the rent on those two. When we fill them up with either district or inter-district <laughs> transfers. Thank you. Okay. Further questions? Any direction for Dr. Sta uh, Dr. Cash? No direction. Hmm? I think move. Well, we no, we like don't. No, we don't need a motion. This is I a. Think we would like. Well, at least I would like to just see us move forward. It sounds like both sides feel that there's, you know, some confidence that we can move forward. Oh yeah, um, absolutely. So they're they're in a great way that's people. Reasonable. They're not unreasonable. Yeah, right. I, I, well, I don't think we are either. And I think that is, since our other two charters aren't at a place here too, I'm also very interested in um, learning from this and trying to figure out what does make sense um, as we move forward with the other um, charter schools because I think that that's going to be <coughs> very fair yeah. or more fair. Are there any other issues other than that? I, I brought that one up. Are there others? No. Nope. So that's great negotiations. Get it down to one item. Okay. There's a, if you read this, there's an awful lot of, between the lines, uh, almost every page, there's whiteouts, changes. Uh, congratulations on a great job of negotiation for the entire Atlante team and the district. And as I said, Meg was, has been tremendous. So thank you. And, and she's sorry she wasn't here, but she's in M-I-S-S-I-S-S-I-P-P-I. -S 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 <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Hat Young, thank you for the work on the portables. I mean, that's going forward, and thank you for your industriousness on that. And what schools did they come from? Monroe and? Both from Monroe. Both from Monroe, okay. And I just have a quick question about that. Is there um, a expected um, length use length of use for those portables? Is it undefined for, no, not, not like as for the portable themselves, but do you see this, I guess, Adelante as something you need for a long time or something that you're hoping is just a five-year thing or? Um, back to the, sorry, to the mic. back to the microphone, Juanita. Not like our board meetings, we just talk from wherever we are. <laughs> So we um, asked the district if we could expand and bring two buildings on the campus 
because um, the enrollment is remaining steady. Um, people in the community are really interested in the opportunity for their kids to learn not one but two languages. And um, so this next year we're going to um, add a fourth grade. So right now we, we've had two classes K three. This year we're going to have a K four. So our family center, our meeting room where we do lots of things, we've emptied it out and we're turning that into a fourth grade room. So we know next year we're going to need a fifth grade room and the year after that a sixth grade room. So um, right now, like in fifth grade, there's 36 kids. Um, I know that's becoming a normal number again, um, but um, our board would like us to try to keep that uh, student class size down. I know when I was teaching, I was showing the staff my picture today as a first year teacher. I had 38 <laughs> first graders and it wasn't a big deal. So when they're like, oh, I have 24, I'm thinking, oh, if you only knew, it's doable. <laughs> but um, so we're going to try to keep class size low. That's in our charter. So um, we're not really expanding. Um, you can see the documents have, have us capped at 290. So we won't be going over 290, just making space for the kids that we do have. You're welcome. Is that 290 an issue, Dr. Cash? No, and our goal is to facilitate to the greatest extent Adelante's success, both academic and their facilities challenges. Yes, thank you. <laughs> how are the four portables uh, on the, the separate four, how are, what are they used for? Um, they are classrooms. One's a fourth, one's a fifth, and two of them are third grade classrooms. So they're all four classrooms now? Yes, and they're all cleaned up and ready to go for another year. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Anything else, board? Okay, thank you very much, and good luck in the final negotiations. Well, aren't you going to say good luck to me? I said, to I said that generically. I didn't okay. say it. Right. I wasn't Just aiming checking. that at anybody. I said good, you know, good luck in the final negotiations. Yeah. Take it as a... You want. Okay. I can't even find my agenda now with all my papers. Okay, here we go. Uh, number five, first reading administrative re regulation board policy 3514-1. I believe we have an amended document in front of us. Yes, you do. And um, you should also be aware that this the, the genesis of this is from uh, Ms. Parker's uh, inquiry as to uh, the safety of our science labs. Um, and it re resulted in fairly comprehensive work by both Dr. Jotty and Mr. Hetyunk, and they're both going to present these items to you. Thank you, Dr. Cash. Good evening, Governor Board and Dr. Heron. Mr. Heron. <laughs> Thank you. We got so used to calling him by the doctor. Job, right? <laughs> <laughs> if I call enough people doctor, I've got to yeah. myself. <laughs> uh, I bring to you uh, the first reading of um, BP 3514.1 and AR 3514.1 uh, regarding hazardous, um, hazardous waste, hazardous substances. I'd like to first uh, discuss BP, the BP, and then we'll go to the AR, uh, if you don't mind. I know it's in reverse order, that we you see on the agenda. Um, uh, board policy 3514.1 is being updated to reflect requirements for a chemical hygiene plan as required by, by state regulations for any employer that maintains a workplace where there is laboratory uh, use of hazardous chemicals such as district, uh, such as a, such as a district that offers science laboratory classes, the policy also adds the policy also um, adds uh, uh, a, a board philosophy statement and reflects the California Department of Education Science Safety Handbook for California public schools. So I brought with me uh, Mr. Hetyunk uh, here, uh, since we'll be working on this project together. Uh, if uh, should you choose to approve all the recommendations. Uh, w um, so we're here to answer any questions that you may have. Um, you'll notice that there's a lot of um, uh, additions written in green and, uh, uh, and a lot of information also struck, uh, struck out as well. So uh, I'll, leave it up to you. Uh, I'll leave it up to you for questions. Uh, Ms. Parker? 
When you talk about the uh, statement of philosophy, do you mean the just the introductory paragraph? Yes. There. Okay. Um, I guess my question is, and it's and it's broader. It applies. It kind of connects B, the BP and the AR. I mean, I think of the BP, uh, the three thousand series, as something that's. Um, uh, you know, it's about business and non-instructional operations, essentially. Yes. yes. And so yeah. I don't necessarily think of that as a place where we're talking about student safety. Um, but I appreciate in the BP the mention of students that when, it, when it's under that the, the, the paragraph that used to say hazard communication program where that's been X'd out. So it does bring in that employees, students, and others as necessary are fully informed of their properties. And I think that that's really appropriate. Yeah. And, um, and I, I think that's great for the BP. I don't really have any questions on the BP. Okay. I think, it, you know, to me that looks well done. Okay. Although I do kind of question if it's correct to bring students into, like the term students into the 3000 series. Um, the one place that the that lab safety is mentioned is in the 5000 series, and that's AR 5142, where there is just one sentence essentially that says a school principal is going to come up with some sort of lab safety plan. Yes. And um, so the AR, the 3514.1, doesn't mention students at all. Um, and so I guess my question is, when we get down to the level of like an exhibit, I mean, is it should it be in the 5,000 series, or is it appropriate just to keep the you know the AR the way it is, where it's really addressing employees? Um, I mean, so it's a that's yes. a question. Right? Yes, question. there um, th there is a component of education or uh, educating our, our teachers. Right. Uh, in this part here, and that's where that's what we're making a nexus to students. Mm -hmm. If the if staff does not know how to implement safety precautions as they are introducing students to these uh, experiments, that obviously that can harm students. But that, that's where the nexus occurred. But we can definitely add to the five thousand. Uh, five thousands. Because it makes sense yes. to me. If we're starting here, and I guess yes. one of my questions is, then do do we leave that language that that piece about students in the BP? Or do we cross that out with the understanding that we'll cross-reference this when it's time to update the, and on, you know, it could be something in the 6,000 series um, because we have a whole piece on science instruction in in the 6,000 series, yes. and I don't know if it should fit there rather than in just the safety piece that's in the 5,000 series. Yes. So um, I think that this is a great first step um, and really extensive. And um, you know, and, and looking at the language and, and both of them, I, I really thought that both were excellent, ex except for my question mark was the long run. Yes. What about you know specifics of? lab safety yes. training with students and making sure that that t teachers were implementing this in connection with students. Yes. Um, so I'll be curious to hear in the future if that's 5,000 or 6,000. I trust you guys to think about that. Yes. Um, but in the meantime, I think that this is a good first, first start in terms of the uh, employees and making sure that the employees have training on how to be safe themselves. Yes. Can we come back on the uh, consent calendar? I guess uh, I'm curious to hear what others or what everybody yeah, say in terms yeah, of the students. I, I want to. I'd love to hear what others have to say. But just in terms of the student piece, should the student piece and uh, just that word students stay in the hazard communication, the X hazard communication paragraph? Should it say that shall ensure that employees, students, and others is necessary if fully informed? I. I think it just. I, I don't have a problem with it staying if if perhaps it it was teased out a little more in terms of uh, uh, clarifying that piece a little more because right now it it the way it stands I, I would see Miss Parker's point which to me seems like it was just added mm -hmm. and not necessarily thought out the way you just expressed it and yes. I think if you were to reword it and come back in a way that says in the uh, everyday functioning of uh, staff who interact with students or something yes. like along those lines, then it makes more sense. Yes. So, uh, so uh, just for clarification, um, we can uh, we can we can either uh, we can either keep the language of the students here and add to the five thousand series, or eliminate yeah. elim uh, or eliminate this. So I think I'm gonna take that back and you can well, what, what yeah. I mean, I think it's important to note that. Students are in the prior 
board policy and AR. Mm -hmm. They're not not in there, so they're uh, they're they're crossed out yeah. with the new language. Well, yes, and so actually, that's a that's a, maybe that that last paragraph on the first page where it says teachers shall instruct students about the importance of proper handling. Da, 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 da. I um, see. I see that I, in your in the lab safety. I mean, it, yes. I mean, we could put language that says student teachers shall instruct students, blah blah blah, pursuant to procedures and protocols adopted as a result or a reference to this board policy and AR mm -hmm. in the 5,000 series. Well, and, and you know, the cross-reference here is to the 6,000s on science instruction, sure. even, though, even though the one piece on lab is yes. in the 5,000. So, you know, something to think about. But I almost like the idea, um, because it's, it's different to say that the superintendent of and shall develop specific measures to ensure the safety of students, then specifically calling out that teachers shall instruct students about the importance of proper handling. So I almost want to bring that sentence back in that's okay. been crossed out. Okay. Um, especially since that was there before. And then think about that cross-reference. Should it be under science instruction or should it be under the, the safety um, AR in, in the 5000 series? Okay. But regardless, um, in the long run, I think what's important to see also is an exhibit tied to either this one or into the, in the in the student section that lays out a timeline of when yes. employees are trained and when students are trained. Yes, our intent was to first get this approved and then uh, uh, and then. Once it's approved, we'll start working on on that exhibit. We'll have to share that with the principals, the teachers, and that's what we that's what we will present to you. Our plan of actually executing this. Super. What do we want to do with these two documents? Can I? I, I think it's okay to come back on consent, okay. um, and then we'll just pull it if we feel like it needs some further tweaking. Yeah. I have a question on the AR. Um, can you point me to where on the AR? I would be able to find or um, the chemical hygiene plan. So it's talked about in both the, uh, yes, but where do I find it? Where do I really find the plan itself? So if I'm someone, I'm reading the AR and the BP, they both mention the chemical hygiene plan, but where do I find the chemical hygiene plan? Is that something that's in the school safety? Yes, we would have to develop, uh, we would have to develop that. Exhibit. As a part of the exhibit. Okay. Yes. Okay, come back on the consent. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, number six, first reading discussion of administrative regulations 4356.1 travel. Mr. Torina. So for the administrative relation, regulation 4356.1, all we're really doing is clearing up the titles and those who would be receiving this uh, mileage rate. Uh, we deleted some titles that no longer exist in our district and we added those that are currently uh, will be using this and, but do not exist in the, in the AR. I'd be willing to make a motion to approve it. Okay. Second. Discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, motion carried. Thank you. So you don't, don't have to come back. Okay. He'll be back. He'll be coming. Okay. Uh, coming events. Don't, Tomorrow morning we have um, a couple press uh, conferences. Uh, uh, future agenda items. I, I want to also remind board members that next week we have our professional learning day at San Marcos High School, and I would be there early in the morning if I was you, if you plan to attend, because Mr. Heron is going to be addressing the entire group, <laughs> so you can hear his speech. But I think it's going to. Are you going to be there videotaping? So if you can't make it, it'll be videotaped for your view. Think about that. I'll um, be there to listen to your speech. Yeah, uh, a, a couple of things. Um, we did add to the agenda update a request from Ms. Limon about the update on solar. Uh, I've asked that at the next meeting, Ms. Parker has an item on the agenda uh, regarding the changes in the law regarding alcohol on camp campuses. And so I've asked it be put on as a conference item so we can give direction to Dr. Cash um, to some degree. Do we want him to go forward and bring it back 
in one way or the other. Um, and so get the general consensus of, of the board um, in that endeavor. And to hear feedback, hopefully, from um, the staff at the various schools, how they feel about it. And so that will be on the agenda as a conference item at the, at the next meeting. And I don't know how to, Dr. Cash, if you could just have somebody look into um, the method of minute taking that we do. Uh, it, it came to my attention in, in where I was, you know, I, I, it, it was in the minutes, not exactly what I had said. And, and I've heard time and time again that really minutes, especially now that we video every meeting, that to try to paraphrase what each one of us says, or our speakers say, or our guests say, or our staff says, I mean, isn't it, is it better to treat uh, minutes as action taken, and if people want further information, to watch the video? I would agree. And then you hear it firsthand. I think there's been an attempt to try to move toward that, as, a, as opposed to what in the past it was more right. descriptive. Yeah, and I've even commented that I like it the way it is, but it's even, it's even come now where the video is there, and I would rather say to somebody, if you really want to know what took place, watch the video. Don't rely on what the, what the minutes say, because we can't read every word of every minute to, to see if we were quoted correctly uh, every single time, or if, the, if, if the public was quoted every single time correctly. So I'd like you to at least think about that, and if you have any suggestions or ideas or legality of what's necessary. Will do. Um, it just seems it might be an easier way to do it, and it might be a better way to do it. Dr. Paz? As a future agenda item, I'd like to see if we can get um, uh, a report on how our summer school, um, uh, say, lunch uh, food program went, the one that took place in various areas. In the community? Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, I just got reminded of that because I went um, last week. I was at um, Oak Park and I saw that they were doing, and there were quite a few people there. And I was like, I wonder how we're doing. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, we can report back how many meals we serve to how many yeah. people. Uh, Ms. Limon? And on your comment about minutes, um, if I recall correctly, we just voted that our committees would have um, uh, action item minutes only. So we're already, if I recall correctly, doing that That's or correct. as a practice for any committees we're on. So it's just a matter of the board meeting. That's correct. Yeah. <clears throat> I was happy to hear on the radio, uh, Nancy Weiss uh, is going to start serving food at Notre Dame. So another, another service by our food pr uh, committee, uh, keeping our staff employed. That's great. Okay, um, anything else? My goodness, 8.15. Should we stick around for a little bit more? You're hired. <laughs>